Hello, this is Albert Verdijk, and uh, this video is about water quality remote sensing. So there's uh, quite a few uh, videos and material on uh, water cycle or water balance remote sensing, uh, but this uh, video particularly wants to look at uh, water quality. Why is that important? Well, there's a number of reasons, but um, but uh, here is a good one. So in this case, we're looking at water quality in the ocean. So here's the estuary of the Burdekin River in northern Queensland. And what you see here is, uh, is a plume of sediment that's been, has obviously been some sort of big rainfall event. Uh, and a lot of sediment has been washed off the hillsides and so forth uh, for, out of the river channel and is ending up through the estuary into the ocean. Uh, and there it's really um, uh, uh, not necessarily a good thing, particularly if there's coral reefs and such as there, as there are along uh, much of the Queensland coast, that can really do some serious damage because of the sediment, but also because of the nutrients uh, and the uh, uh, and then maybe the pesticides that it contains. So we want to know when do these plumes occur, uh, what drives the uh, uh, the severity and uh, and the distance that these plumes travel uh, into into the ocean and, and onto the uh, coral reefs. So to do that, we use remote sensing. Now, um, radiative transfer in water is uh, is a, a more complicated than uh, uh, for for land surfaces because you got the same um, uh, earth surface properties uh, that uh, that you have with the land surface. You know, you have corals or plants or or, or bare ground at the bottom of the water. You got the same atmospheric transfer issues that you have uh, with uh, land surface remote sensing. But on top of that, you have the radiative transfer through the water, and that's what this figure, uh, which is also used in the previous video, shows. You know, it's it's not water just doesn't simply travel through water. It it reflects at the at the surface, uh, seen as glint here, for instance. It reflects on particles in the water, seen that seen here. The backscattering that you see there is because of uh, turbidity in the water, uh, and then of course uh, it also uh, refracts at the water surface. So the uh, the incident angle uh, doesn't remain the same. It changes the moment it hits the water. And so there's a there's a more complicated problem in many ways. To solve there uh, inversely when you do inverse radiative transfer modeling than, uh, than for, for lens surface remote sensing. Uh, but still, you, this, some of the basics remain the same. And as this diver here is showing, uh, you still need to collect the spectral properties of the surfaces uh, that uh, you might be interested in. So, if you're trying to um, measure the health of the corals, for instance, uh, to, to detect coral bleaching events. Uh, and here's uh, a picture that shows some of the things that I said before. So, you see number of uh, radio transfer things going on and you see the um, the reflectance the glint at the at the surface from the waves uh, depending on the uh, on the on the how, what the uh, angle is of the wave of the, uh, the water surface you get more or less reflectance towards you uh, you also see uh, uh, the um, the different colors uh, of uh, of uh, uh, of the spectrum come back at you depending on what constituents are in there algae for instance in this case there's obviously some sediment uh, or uh, in other cases, like here, there might be very little, and the um, the uh, radiation might uh, go quite deep into the water before being um, partially reflected back. So, so yeah, there's a lot of things that you can tell from the, the color of the water, and I, I use the word color kind of advisedly because uh, once you get into the near uh, the near infrared and, and shortwave infrared um, uh, domain, there's actually very little um, to to see uh, about water. It's got very low. Reflectance. So a lot of the applications here are indeed in the uh, in the visible uh, domain. And to demonstrate that, I suppose you can you can look at uh, some of the different constituents of the water. You can look at uh, the organic matter, which uh, shows some features in this range. Uh, so going here from uh, from from uh, uh, red to uh, to blue, uh, you can see uh, suspended solids tend tend up to you know, show a bit brown if you like. Of course, chlorophyll tends to show a bit. Green, a blue green algae, algae to show a bit blue green, uh, and and so you know basically you, it, this comes quite close to actually looking at the color of things, uh, with the difference that uh, depending on the instrument that you're using, it might have a better ability to see difference between slightly different uh, colors. Okay, so here's an example of how you might use water quality remote sensing and how it is being used. In the, in the Great Barrier Reef. So the Great Barrier Reef is an enormously large area that the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef Authority has to manage. Uh, and so they need remote sensing to really look at 
where water quality issues occur and how they might be changing, uh, increasing or decreasing from year to year. So that's the remote sensing is really helpful there. And, and, and this is to show you the, uh, the number of weeks that river plumes sort of affect water quality. So as you can see, some areas uh, regularly have, uh, have uh, sediment laden waters, uh, turbid, turbid waters along the, the coast. Uh, and as you go further out to sea, normally the water becomes a lot clearer. And you can make a look at different maps, total suspended solids, that's what TSS stands for, or uh, you can look at chlorophyll, or you can uh, look at organic matter. Uh, and, uh, and each of those uh, have their impact on, on uh, water quality and on the corals uh, and other ecosystems that you find in the Great Barrier Reef. And finally, you can uh, turn into that into these sorts of risk maps. So where are the water quality risk highest and where have the lowest? All right, well, that was uh, ocean water quality remit sensing. Um, you can use pretty much the same principles for inland water quality remit sensing as well. And uh, here's one example <coughs> of a uh, so-called black water event. And uh, black water events occur, uh, for instance, in the, uh, in the Murray River system if uh, if uh, there are wetlands uh, or, or forest floodplain forests that have not received a flood for quite a while and then suddenly a flood comes in and and, and uh, you know uh, washes out a lot of organic matter uh, leaves and, and, and the like uh, and in fact so much so that you get anoxic conditions uh, in the water the water turns black hence the block black water event uh, uh, name of it uh, and really starts to uh, have some quite serious effects, like killing off fish and whatnot, and, and pretty much anything that relies on oxygen. Uh, that can happen naturally if there's a flood at an unusual time, but it can also happen because uh, floodwaters were released, perhaps uh, in an environmental watering uh, event, to try and help that floodplain. And so, uh, we really want to understand the, the uh, Murray Darling Basin Authority in this case, for instance, really wants to understand blackwater events and how to avoid them. Uh, and so. Yeah, this obviously is a, is a, is a, is a black water, quite easy to detect in this case. It shows up pretty dark, as you can see, uh, and uh, is easily distinguished from water that doesn't have those, uh, those problems. Um, even at quite fine scales, in this case, Burley Griffin, we can do a fair bit of water quality monitoring because we're particularly looking at the uh, visible part of the spectrum where we do have uh, oftentimes quite higher resolution uh, measurements, we, we can do quite a quite a bit of detailed uh, analysis. And so here you see uh, estimates of chlorophyll on a particular day, the 17th of March 2010, right from world view, uh, two meter resolution imagery. Uh, we can look at the other particulates, blue and algae, uh, uh, certainly an issue in uh, Lake Burley Griffin that is uh, being managed for, uh, and we can start to classify water types as well according to those different uh, water quality indicators. So. Uh, even for relatively small water bodies, uh, remote sensing can still uh, provide some, some useful information. All right, well, that uh, were just a few examples of uh, remote sensing of water quality.